Welcome to episode 277, Battle-Tested Strategies and Exercises for Being Your Best with Dr. Mark Guadagnoli. Welcome to the Be That 1% podcast. I'm your host, James Silvis, mindset specialist and performance coach. And here on the show, I'm going to challenge you to think deeper, commit to greatness, and develop a stronger mindset. You'll hear stories from those who are living life on their terms, and you'll receive strategies that will help you level up. So the question is, are you ready to be your own 1%? Let's get started. Hey, Be That 1% family, welcome back to the podcast. I'm super grateful and excited that you're here because you are going to listen either for the first time or again, Dr. Mark Guadagnoli. He's been on the show before and anytime I can get him back on the show, it's always a, a special experience for me because of all the people that I've ever had to interact with or had the opportunity to connect with, I would say Dr. G is on the top three highly impactful people in my life and a large part of what I do was inspired by him. And so I'm always excited for those who know me to then learn from him uh, and see some similarities and then just also learn some from the wealth of knowledge that Dr. G has. So in this episode, you're going to learn a lot of uh, frameworks, strategies. Uh, you're going to hear some stories that are going to help you live at your best and also learn strategies to communicate and connect with yourself, with others, uh, and enhance your level of communication, which is really what life's all about. I mean, we want connection, we want to feel valued, we wanna make a difference, and a large part of that comes down to how you look at the world, what you think, and what you do. And Dr. G is so good at distilling complexity into simplicity for you to implement and execute on. So excited for you to get as much value as I've gotten over the years in this episode. Second thing I want to talk about is uh, an experience that I'm in the process of creating for 2024, start date roughly March, April, uh, and it, it's going to be for purpose-driven, heart-led leaders who want to create a team of superheroes with whom they can connect, collaborate, and build with. And if you've been following me for a while, you'll know that Be That 1% is nearly a decade old, and it originated with an idea. That's where it started, and now it's a podcast that's reached over 130 countries and continues to grow, largely because of you and your continued support of coming here, listening, and sharing these episodes and the, and the, the content that we, we create here on the show. But it's also a movement and a brand, and now a mastermind experience. And when you combine that type of container with the right rituals and habits, you're able to serve at the highest levels. And I truly believe that in order to live a, a fulfilling lifestyle, like one that you're super proud of, it needs to be rooted in some form of service. And having worked with clients all over the world, I've began to notice that although they're doing well professionally, they've experienced challenges in three major areas. Number one is relationships. Their spouse, their kids, their business partner, their friend, you know, any type of relationship tends to get begin to have distance and disconnection because their focus is placed in other areas leading to unfulfilled needs emotional tension and and an energy drain the second is purpose and spirituality their zest for life for their work for their future has faded they've lost sight of their impact they they may feel burnt out robotic or stressed and and need to reestablish their intention their purpose and their vision for their life business and relationships and lastly their fitness, they've gained weight, they've lost muscle mass, or they haven't challenged themselves physically in a long time, resulting in feeling sluggish or out of shape or just not as sharp as they once were. And my intention with creating this experience, this mastermind, is for you to fire on all cylinders to live a 1% lifestyle. And so through this nine-month journey with 12 other heart-led leaders, the goal would be to, for you to become the best shape of your life, to develop the skills to acquire and build solid, long-lasting relationships, and uncover slash rediscover your purpose for all aspects of life, and to do it in a container where people are equally as committed as you. 
And so what's included in all of this is an international five to seven day retreat to start off the experience. We have group calls, we have one-on-ones, we have guest people coming in to share their wisdom, insights, and strategies, and then we have a domestic retreat in Las Vegas where we'll be doing the physical challenge uh, that is really, really hard mentally, emotionally, and physically that everyone in the group will be training for and completing in that on that in-person experience um, in, in Las Vegas. And so if this sounds interesting to you if you're like that sounds really cool you want to be in that type of environment and truly make 2024 your best year not just professionally but in all areas and to do it with people that you can build things with then send me a dm or an email both are in the show notes show notes links and i'll send you an additional survey to get it has eight questions, roughly five minutes, take you to, to fill it out, and that will give me additional information to customize this experience even more. But I would love to to have you in this. If this resonates, uh, let me know. Shoot me that email or DM, and I will send over that link. All right, without further ado, thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for being here today, and on to the episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Be That 1% podcast. If this is your first time to the show, welcome. And if you are a return listener, thank you and welcome home. Today, I get to sit across from one of my favorite people in the world. I'm going to explain who he is, what he's done, uh, and how he's impacted my life. And I'm excited to dive into his mind, his heart, his soul, because in my 13 years-ish knowing him, Uh, Not only have I seen different versions of him, but all of those versions are incredible and inspiring. And so my guess is that within minutes of you hearing his voice and just how he operates, you'll you'll feel that sense too. But I'm sitting across from Dr. Mark Guadagnoli, who has worked in the industry of academia for over two decades. He has taught lectured at Harvard, MIT, UCLA, UNLV, and USC and has been featured in publications such as New York Times, Time Magazine, USA Today, Golf Digest, and has appeared on the History Channel and CBS. That wasn't enough. He is a professor of neuroscience and neurology for the Kirk Kirk Kirkorian uh, School of Medicine at UNLV, and he will develop and execute the school's intercession program, which provides medical students with resources for effective learning and performance strategies, communication and life skills, and specialized medical curricula. Dr. G has also published more than 100 articles and abstracts that is and is the author of two books, Human Learning, Biology, Brain, and Neuroscience, and Practice to Learn, Play to Win. His work has been featured in publications such as the New York Times, as I mentioned before, USA Today, and many, many more. Most importantly, Dr. G is a mentor, a brother, the godfather to my first son, Aiden, and a teacher uh, at heart. And so without further ado, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, James. Appreciate it. Yeah, so uh, let's start with some rapid fire questions. My first one is, where were you born and raised? Dallas, Texas. Actually, uh, more technically, Oak Cliff, (laughs) which is South Dallas. Okay, okay. What is a philosophy that you live by? Wow. You know, I think uh, inspire and be inspired. Mm. I like that. Fitting. What is a recent book that you've read that has offered immense value? The Alchemist, again. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I'm I'm rereading Thinking Grow Rich as well, which is really interesting to reread now. Yeah. Okay. What piece of advice have you received that has served you well? Oh, God, there's so many things. I mean... um, you know, just today, actually, I was talking to a friend and he was telling me about how he's recognized that he talks to himself in a way that wasn't helpful, mm-hmm. right? And and so the conversation was about him negotiating about against himself, against his greatness. So I, I don't know that it was advice, uh, although several things are going to come to mind, Um but I think that's it. Don't negotiate against yourself, right? Mm. To be be your best person that you can be. Yeah. Make the contract sign. Yeah. Nice. And then last one is, what does the world need more of right now? 
You know, it's it, in a lot of ways, it seems like the world's in a mess. I mean, mm-hmm. you could see so many different things, you know, finances, war, you know, all these types of things. It sounds super obvious to say that the world needs more love. It does. Um, but I think in the micro, like what we can do individually mm-hmm. is really uh, care for ourselves and be uh, graceful with ourselves and those people around us. And then, you know, that's really where we can make a direct contribution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I've learned so much from you. Thank As you. you know, I tell you that every time. I won't stop telling you that. So just keep getting and thank used you to for that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and our relationship has been such a fun evolution to be yeah. a part of. And I'm very, very grateful for where it has been and, and where it continues to go. Both of us w- don't know yet, but excited for it all. You, one of the things that I love about you is your ability to make very complex things simple and to give people very useful frameworks to perceive the world in a way that supports their best, whatever their best is, right? Mm -hmm. Challenge point theory is something that you've kind of coined and and experimented with written books about, talk about at length at, for some of the, at some of the best universities and places. And, and maybe there's an undertone of, in your answer that will come from the question I'm about to ask. But when you look out at the world right now and you see what you mentioned, that that chaoticness, how do you interpret that? Like do you, when you look at that chaos, is it like, man, the world's really going downhill. What can I do to help this? Do you look at it as I, I understand where the breakdowns are and I want to go solve problems there? Like how, what is your first kind of take on that analysis? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't... I would never pretend that I know where the breakdowns are mm-hmm. or how to solve the problems, but but there are some simple things that mm-hmm. I think about. You know, it, to me, when when there is a, con, a problem that happens individually or in a group or society or whatever, there's some simple lesson that we haven't heard yet, right? Mm-hmm. That we haven't listened to yet, and and oftentimes, and this is where it gets back to challenge point. Oftentimes, it's something that's that in the moment might seem difficult, but in the long run, it makes things much easier and much cleaner. Mm-hmm. And But we, for whatever reason, we choose not to accept that information at the time, that lesson. You know, it, so Challenge Point's interesting because when it was originally developed, yeah. it, it was developed as a an answer to 100 plus years of science that didn't seem to make sense. And so... You know, fortunately, my co-author Tim Lee and I made sense of it from uh, really a simple interpretation of the of all this data that nobody had looked at for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And and as you know, it essentially says that there is an optimal level of challenge for success, for learning, for performance, and so forth. And that optimal level of challenge is unique to the individual. Right? That's like the biggest abstract of it. Mm-hmm. But then I started thinking about it in, as a lens to look at things in life. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the other part of that, which we didn't talk about in the original paper, was the idea that we need to accept that challenge, right? Not accept it as I have to do it, but accept it as a gift, which is essentially a stepping stone to get higher, higher, higher. And I think that and I'm including myself in this, I think that if we are able to do that on a regular basis, we stop looking at things as problems and we start looking at things as opportunities, it really reframes our life, right? Because it's so easy to look at uh, all the problems. Mm -hmm. And, but again, if we reframe that as, you know, a potential place where we can make a contribution for, for ourselves, for the people we care about and so forth, it, it changes everything. Yeah. Why don't people do that? Uh, well, it's a great question. I mean, I think a lot of it is human nature. Yeah. I mean, you, you, your default is to look at problems. And, and the reason is because when our genetic structure was being developed, you know, eons ago, the problems were important, right? Because if there was a problem, if there was something that was wrong, that may be life-threatening mm-hmm. at the time. We don't live in that environment anymore, but our, our genes are still from that time. 
And so we default to negative. Um, it's, it's funny, you know, I think about when, when somebody takes a flight someplace and they, and, and if the, nothing happened wrong on the flight, um, how was your flight? It was fine. That's it. But if anything happened, right, a baby crying, bumpy uh, landing, whatever it is, that's a story. Mm -hmm. How was your flight? Oh, my God. This baby was crying through the whole flight, right? So it's not only that we recognize default to recognize negativity, but we share that negativity with other people, which not only tells them, uh-oh, look for problems on your flight too, mm -hmm. but it also encodes it for us even deeper. Mm -hmm. And but and you know this because <laughs> we talk about this so many times. Human nature is designed for protection. It is not designed for greatness. So if we want to rise above that negative default, we need to do it effortfully in the mm -hmm. beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And then eventually it becomes our habit. Yeah. How much of the the hardwiring ties in with attachment to the problem? A huge amount. I mean, you know, the, the Buddhist philosophy that all suffering comes from attachment, right? Yeah. It's... I can tell you when I very first heard it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> like, that's the real deal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, attachment to our ideas, attachment to how we think something should be, attachment to, uh, you know, something happening in a way that we wouldn't have designed it. Mm -hmm. And yet it's often those things that are happen in a way that we wouldn't design it that are our greatest teachers. But we don't want that because it feels like a lack of control. Right? Yeah. So, and and with that control, is there there a dip in our identity and who and the value that we see ourselves as? Well, it's interesting, it, and I'm I'll confess right now I've never thought about it till you ask the question. But I think it's a really interesting question because the answer is yes, but it shouldn't be right. yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it is a threat to our identity, a threat to who we are, but. You know, then the real question is, is that identity who we want to be, right? Is that our greatest self? Right. Because for most of us, the answer is no. So then the, the, the next level question is, okay, is that a threat to our greatest self? And the answer is probably no, mm. right? But most of us, and again, I put myself in this category, most of us don't live our lives right. as our greatest self. Yes, because of stress, uh, maybe so many environmental factors, responsibilities, kids, like there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. When you interact with someone that, you know, hasn't yet created that framework or operates from that on a regular basis, what would you say is your first kind of task for them to do so that they can begin asking themselves that question? Is this harming my best self as opposed to just allowing the problem to get so big that the problem controls who they are, their behaviors, their emotional reactions, all of that. I th I think the the typically the first thing, and I say typically, I'll explain that in just a second. But typically, the first thing is to go through what I call the foundation document. And the foundation document starts with what are moments of joy in your life, and so that question disarms people first and and provides a lot of insight, right? Because once you start listing these things, for if you can list these things, right? Because yeah. some people are like, I, I, I can't really think of anything. Well, that's that's a pretty important piece of information yeah. right there, right? But once they start listing these things, there are patterns that you start to see that come up, like adventure or a challenge, you know, overcoming challenge or being with family or mm -hmm. those kinds of things. And those types of things inform us as far as what we truly value, right? And in a lot of ways, those moments of joy are moments that come from our greatest self. And so you get to identify it without asking a person, what is your greatest self? Because most of us don't know. Yeah. Right. So, so that's really a good start. And then what do we do to get to that on a regular basis? And then, okay, this decision that you're making right now, mm -hmm. is that aligned with those values, is that aligned with that greatest self that we talked about before? Mm -hmm. You know, I said earlier about not negotiating uh, with yourself. Uh, what 
what I mean by that is a lot of times there's something that we don't do. Like we we don't raise our hand in class because, you know, we're afraid. But we make an excuse, right? Oh, I don't want to bother the class, or I don't want to, you know. And, and then the question is really simple. Would your greatest self do that? What would your greatest self do, right? And the answer is almost always super obvious. I'd raise my hand because, you know, I can learn and I can help other people learn, right? Um, but we negotiate with ourselves on that. Yeah. And so it really comes down to are the decisions and the behaviors and the mindsets you have aligned with your greatest self. And this question, as simple as it sounds, what are 10 moments of joy in your life? They help you to start defining that greatest self mm. for you. Mm. I like that. The... You worked with Zappos and you were, you know, responsible for creating that culture in a lot of ways and what it kind of morphed into. You worked hand in hand close with Tony Shea. What were some of the things that you init you implemented at Zappos that you think contributed to the level of success that they've had both as an organization, as a culture, and even as a, uh, just a force to change the way business was done at that time? Yeah, you know, uh, so I'll tell you. So first of all, I appreciate you giving me credit for it, but the Zappos uh, was a relatively new but remarkable com company mm -hmm. when I started working with them. So they already had a culture. They had already established their values, their 10 values, core values. Um, and they had a great leadership. Tony Shea, as you mentioned, Fred Mosler, uh completely underrated, but a remarkable, remarkable human being. Alfred Lynn as well, who was the CFO at the time. Fred, by the way, uh, uh, when I was working there, graduated from having the title of a, a senior VP to no title, and uh, which I think is fantastic. Cool. But I think really what so my primary job there was to develop Zappos University, which um, had a few different functions. One of them was the onboarding uh, an orientation program, which Zappos is, it was already there. We just, you know, kind of upgraded it a little bit. Um, it, it's a remarkable program. What you, one of the things about it is after the first few days, they would offer employees money to leave. Yeah. You know, it started out with like $500 and I think it ended at like $3,000. I think so, yeah. And that was like the first time any company has done yeah, that, right? Any any company. And the, the point was, it's, it's, this is, I think this is a really interesting thing because on the surface, it was like, wow, Zappos is paying you to leave. So the, the obvious thing is if you uh, set, stay, you're really making commitment, mm -hmm. right? And that's what everybody thought about. And that's true. The other thing is it just makes financial sense because if you have to replace that employee at some point, you know, in the next couple of years, because they never were really bought in, it's going to cost you way more than $3,000 to replace that individual. Mm. So this is the genius of, of Tony and Fred and Alfred, and, you know, because they figured that piece out, not just the first level or the second level, they kept figuring out levels on levels. Mm. And it was remarkable. It was an incredible learning experience for me. And I'm happy to say that, you know, I'm still friends uh, with Fred and, and Alfred, you know, Tony until his passing. But, um, yeah, it was an incredible journey. But so th so that was one of the major things, the onboarding program mm -hmm. and orientation. The other one was the development, professional and personal development of the team at Zappos. So this is things like we develop the uh, pipeline. So how do you... Uh, move from an entry-level employee to a senior employee? Uh, what are the courses that you take within Zappos, which were all taught, by the way, by Zappos mm. people, who were some of the best teachers I've ever seen in my life. You know, I've been in universities for over 30 years mm. and as a, as a faculty member, and these they were remarkable. Um, yeah, I still remember s several of them and just being in awe at how they taught with no formal uh, education for teaching. They're just really good people who cared. And uh, so that was part of it. And and then there were other classes within that, like yoga and and all kinds of other classes that 
brought the culture, you know, helped fortify the culture. And then there was Zappos Insights, which was bringing people in from outside of Zappos and teaching them kind of the Zappos way. And that was the revenue generation piece. I remember Tony saying, I asked him when he asked me if I would run Zappos University. And I said, yeah, what is it? And he says, well, that's your job. Right? <laughs> Tell us what it is yeah. and figure it out. But it has to be, you know, self-sufficient financially within three years. Mm. Okay. That sounds fun to do. That Zappos Insights created revenue for the rest of the program and actually gave money back to Zappos as well. Wow. So, but, uh, you know, so, so I can easily tell you the things I learned there. Uh, and I hope that some of the things I did contributed, uh, at the very least, it sort of formalized some of those things that were happening to fortify the culture. Yeah. A lot of the listeners um, that listen to this podcast are a version of a leader in mm -hmm. their companies and their families and their communities. And one of the things that I want to talk about more on the podcast is, is about communication. Mm -hmm. Teaching can be an extension of that. And you mentioned that you saw some of the best teachers inside Zappos that didn't have any formal education or background. What was it that maybe care was the main driving force, but how did that get expressed? What strategies or tactics did they did they use that you were like, that's really cool, never thought about doing it like that, and since have maybe incorporated that into your style or that's influenced you in some way? Yeah, you know, I, I love this question because I recognized right away that they were great teachers. I didn't take it apart, which is kind of funny mm. now that I think about it. So I'm going to take it apart okay. in, in real time <laughs> Let's do right it. now. Um, so there were a few things. One, they they had uh, a, a, a deep knowledge of their subject matter. Mm. And, and it was so obvious, but they didn't overwhelm the class with their subject matter. Right. This now, as I'm thinking about it, it gets a little bit to challenge point. Right. You mm -hmm. challenge people at a level that is appropriate for them. Correct. And and these people could have come in and given all the information they knew about marketing or all the information they knew about uh, you know kids wear or whatever it happened to be, but they didn't. They gave the appropriate amount, and as the as the student uh, got more and more knowledgeable, mm -hmm. they raised the level of mm -hmm. what they did. So I think that that was one of them. The other one is that there, were, there was no ego involved with them teaching. It was very clear that their goal was to, to give the gift of knowledge to the people that they were talking to. Mm. And uh, so many times in, in formal education, there's an ego there, whether people realize it or not. If the teacher is challenged by the student, the teachers sometimes get pissed off about that, yeah. right? Instead of going, how cool is this? The student challenged me. I don't mean being offensive or anything. I mean, just saying, Curious. I, yeah. I don't understand that. Can you explain it again? That's a challenge to teachers. I mean, that's the student challenging the teacher. It doesn't sound like it, but it is. I don't understand, mm -hmm. right? The, what they what these people I'm talking about, you know, Pam and, and Chris and, and these people, Mike and those people at Zappos, they would say, oh, that's a really good question. Let me give you a different example of this, right? It wasn't like, oh, you just stabbed me in my ego. Yeah. It's let me help to understand that. And, and maybe I'll learn something from it as well. Yeah. So I think that that was another piece. And... And then the other one, they were always very, very well prepared, but it never felt like it was sanitized, right? It never felt mm -hmm. rigid mm -hmm. at all. And so it, this will sound like an odd segue, but you've seen the movie The Last Samurai, right? Of course. Okay. I only saw it because of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an assignment. <laughs> um, there's a scene in there that, that you'll recognize right away. So Tom Cruise, who is the... Uh, the antagonist in this uh, movie, the antagonist slash hero. Um, it's a hero's journey movie, which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons I love it so much. He's been captured by the samurai. He's living in their village because they're snowed in and they can't get out of the village until the spring. And the, and the samurai are actually teaching him how to be a samurai, which is crazy, right? He's yeah. the enemy, but they're teaching him. And he's really working super hard to try and do this. And and mechanically, he's gotten very, very good at sword sword play or swordsmanship, whatever mm -hmm. it happens to be. 
but the teacher is kicking his ass every day. And finally, this guy who eventually becomes his friend says to Tom Cruise, too many minds. Do you remember this mm -hmm. scene? And and what he meant by it is you're thinking too much, right? Just, just react. Just be in the moment and d let your body go. The thing about that scene that's so important to me is not just letting it go. It's that he has learned the craft and then he lets it go, right? So if you suck at sword play and you just let it go, it's yeah. a bad situation, right? Mm -hmm. But he learned the craft and now he needs to let it happen. And I think that's what those teachers did. They, they knew very, very well what was happening. They were very prepared about it. And then they walked in and let it go. And it was, it was like a symphony, you know, mm -hmm. watching a symphony happen in front of you. We don't think about the complexities of a symphony. We just enjoy the music. And that's what happened in those classrooms. Yeah. And it was, it was remarkable. I think it was Bruce Lee's quote that says, <clears throat> study the form so that you could become formless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Know the rules so you know which ones to break. Right. Kind of like this yeah. line, line of thinking. Yeah. Which I, I think is really important because if you don't have the appropriate skill level and you're trying to let it go, then you're not really learning. I mean, maybe you are, but not, it's not directional. It's not as intentional as it can be up. And then, so then my question for that is like, how do you know when you get to that level of skill? Is that someone else saying that you're there or is that an internal thing? Is that just trial and error and you figure it out along the way? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a cool question. Lots of these, by the way, I've never thought about. Yeah, so. no, I know this is good. Yeah. Um, I, I think two <laughs> things. I think there are two answers to this. One, um, it's not about knowing that you're there. It's about letting go when you're in the moment. And then you find out if you were there. Okay. And number two, you're never there because yeah. it always changes. <laughs> and so, but you have to be okay with that, right? right. Because that's the, the other thing that I got from what you said was there's an opportunity. And, and I think great teachers do this. There's an opportunity to learn while you're teaching. Yeah. You know, I was talking totally. to somebody the other day and I was telling him he, he, he was having a, a really difficult time, kept getting the rug pulled out from under him, uh, you know, figuratively in all these different things. And I said, you know, I think what's happening is there's a lesson that you're not willing to learn yet. And the lesson is control. You, you're mm -hmm. holding on so tight to control that you're not able to let go and, and ha be successful. Well, I, I don't know where that came from exactly from me, but all of a sudden I'm like, holy crap, I'm doing the same thing, <laughs> right? Right. It's, it, it's in teaching, and you know this, mm -hmm. in teaching, it's the greatest opportunity to learn. Yeah. But you can't teach from a place of ego and learn at the same time, right? And so that's why being rid of ego in that situation is, is not important. It's necessary, Right to mm -hmm. to really serve the people you're teaching and learn the most out of that environment. Yeah, there's so many so many factors there. It's like I got to be so comfortable with myself that no external thing could cause me to think too much about myself, and instead and instead focus on the mission, which is to create an environment where everyone is engaged and everyone can learn. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I'm going to say is for me, right? Yeah. Because I think that each person has their own way of doing it. I don't, for me, I don't feel like I need to be so comfortable with myself. I just need to have faith and courage. Okay. Um, because <clears throat> I don't know everything and there's, there are things that are going to come up that may stump me, what a cool opportunity that is, right? Yeah. Again, this is part of challenge point. It's when you run into these points of adversity, that's a point of opportunity. Right, not a problem. Right, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's, it's really interesting because to me, the difference between it being an opportunity or a problem is ego. It's a problem if oh my God, I don't know that answer. I don't know the answer. Right. Yeah. It's an opportunity when it's how cool is this to learn something, mm -hmm. right? And <clears throat> so, so I think 
and I'm I'm just sort of thinking through this as we're talking, but I think that the for me it's more I'll do my best to prepare for the opportunity, but then I I'll just let go, right? Yeah. You know, you had a, a workshop one time here in Vegas. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, it was a great workshop. And at one point you'd asked me to speak about a something. And I say something because I don't actually remember what it was. <laughs> yeah. But but there was a, a woman in, in the front who I had asked a question and she raised her hand. And it was really interesting because for whatever reason, I could tell that she was very frightened about raising her hand. I was so impressed with the courage that she had. And I said something to her because I felt this. And... It was almost shocking the way that she responded in such a positive way. Mm -hmm. That wasn't anything I prepared. That was something I felt in the moment mm -hmm. of what was happening. And I think that, but I also think that because the person prepares, they're more able to be in the moment yeah. and more able to connect at that point. Right. And read what the room is requiring. Right. Exactly. And adapt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is good. <clears throat> a lot of leaders on the show, right? We talked about some communication strategies, some things that you've noticed from Zappos. Let's go more into like interpersonal communication. Maybe, maybe you could use some professional examples, or maybe you want to use inter like interper like per intimate relationship examples. But I feel like there's a there's a communication breakdown somewhere. Uh, or it can be enhanced in a lot of ways, both in how people talk to themselves and how they talk to other people. What are some useful strategies that you use on the daily to create and foster collaborative kind of conversations that lead to either a breakthrough or a learning opportunity or, or just a meaningful talk about anything? What are some things that you use regularly for that? Well, so there's two things that jump in mind. Well, the one of them is, uh, I think the one you're going towards <laughs> is competitive and cooperative communication. Yeah. And, you know, this, you know, the story about how this was developed really by having a discussion, I'll call it, with my son yeah. at the yeah. time. <laughs> right. But, but the, the essence of it is that I was trying to figure out ways that we could come together on a place where we were not together. And he was just trying to get out of, in this case, going someplace that we were going to go. He wanted to play his video games, right? That, and so he would say or do anything to get out of it. So what came from this was an understanding that kind of two ends of the spectrum, he was on a competitive side. He wanted to win this discussion and I was on a cooperative side, I wanted us to come together because the relationship was more important. And in that particular situation, once I realized that, I said, Max, here's what I think is going on. You're just trying to win and you'll say whatever you want to say to win. And I'm trying to cooperate and, you know, trying to figure out ways that we could come together and we're missing each other. So, so we're never going to resolve this because we're playing a different game, right, by different rules. And I asked him at the time, I said, look, he was seven or eight, I think. And I said, are you more interested in our relationship being good or in you winning an argument? And at the time, he said, I'm more interested in our relationship being good. Obviously, as he grew up, that changed, you know, multiple times. All through the teens, I think yeah, it leaned towards right. the win the argument, right? Now it's more on the cooperative side, but but there are some specific things that occurred to me from from this whole uh, argument. And I've I've taught this many many times because it's it's incredible how it changes people's perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you are in a competitive on the competitive side, there are certain things that happen. You're you're not listening to the other person to to hear to understand them. You're listening to pounce on them, right? Mm -hmm. They misspoke. They you're you're listening and you're defending your argument and you're thinking uh, not about what they're saying, but about what you're going to rebut. Right now, you know that you're in a competitive situation. When you're thinking more about 
winning than you are the relationship, you're in a competitive situation. And But the other side's true as well. If you're lis listening with empathy, there's a, a great line, I think it's Brene Brown who said, empathy builds advocacy. When you're listening with empathy, you're really trying to understand the other person. You're opening a space for the two of you to come together, not necessarily agreeing, but at least being respectful of each other. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things improve the relationship. And now, because you're not defensive, you're more likely to be open to the other person's opinion, at least to understand it. And in the long run, that actually improves the relationship. It's like, you know, if, if you and I, if I say something to you like, oh, oh nice black shirt, right? Because we know each other, you're like, oh, he likes my black shirt. If we had a different lens that we were looking for, you may think, what an ass. This guy's, you know, yeah. ragging on my black shirt. The statement is the same, right? But it's the interpretation of the statement. So, and this, this is even worse in emails and these kinds of <laughs> things, right? Because we don't have this paralanguage, this body language that we can pick up. So... If we lean towards cooperative, we're listening to actually hear the person. We're listening with empathy. We're creating a space for alignment. And you you find out that you start asking questions rather than making statements. Mm -hmm. Like in a competitive sense, you're going to say something like, well, that's not right. Or I don't understand that. Or this is more important, you know, statements, right? Yeah. In a cooperative, you're more likely to say, can you tell me more about that? Or this is actually an interesting point. I didn't think about it. Can we expand this a little bit? Or do you think this is right mm -hmm. based on what you're saying? Right. So it becomes a different, yeah. a really different dance. It's discovery. Right. Yeah. And so, and, and again, it's not just for that moment. It's also for the relationship, which then impacts future conversations as well, mm -hmm. including email or text or whatever. So in this whole thing, people, if that's all they hear, they think, oh, we should try to strive for cooperative communication. That's not true. You yeah. use the right tool in the right situation. You know, I work at as med school, as you mentioned, and, and I work with trauma surgeons and emergency physicians and so forth. They don't have time. It's a life and death situation. And so in those moments, it really is competitive. There's a hierarchy and it has to be followed and we have to get this done or this person's going to die, mm -hmm. right? But outside of that environment, it can be cooperative. And then when you're in that environment and it becomes competitive, people are okay with it mm -hmm. because they understand the necessity of it. So there are right times for different communication tools, but if you never think about it, you just default and yeah. you typically default on the competitive side. What does the competitive and cooperative conversation look like towards yourself? So, you know, this is really interesting. Um, the friend that I was talking about today was saying he's he's been judging himself. Yeah. And he didn't recognize it until he was kind of quiet for a while and he realized what was being said. You know, one of my favorite sayings is if you want to know where you're going to be in five years listen to how you talk to yourself now yeah right and so it is exactly the same with yourself and and in a lot of ways it's more important because we're talking about the relationship with ourselves mm -hmm. and it's remarkable the things that some of us say to ourselves we would never accept that from someone else and yet we say these things to ourselves matter of factly mm -hmm. Um, you know, oh, you're so dumb. I can't believe you did that. You know, this is stupid. I wish I was taller. I wish I was, you know, had blue eyes, I, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And it just doesn't help us. You know, again, this is this is one of the things where we're negotiating against our own greatness. Why would you do that, yeah. right? And yet most of us, in fact, I, I, most everybody does that at yeah. some point. Yeah. It's the extent to which we do it that is the issue. So there's your greatest self, right? <clears throat> and you're in some in some ways cross-referencing your current behaviors to whatever that greatest self is. That is that is judgment to a degree, right? It is, but it's it's. Um, let me see if I agree with that. I think that it is or judgment, it but not in the... I think it's observation, but... See, judgment to me yeah. 
is is making a, a statement like that's not good or that's bad or whatever. Usually a negative kind of connotation. It's typically a yeah. negative connotation. So I think observation, if you can be objective about it, is going to help you a lot more. Mm-hmm. You know, the, we use a feedback method called good, better, how, yeah. as you know. Um, and uh, the good is, you know, what was good about this situation? What What's good about this podcast? What's good about the way I drove over here? What's good, you know, and so forth. Um, and there's reasons for it. It's not just a pat on the back. It's really to establish the foundation level and to reward those behaviors that are positive. Mm-hmm. The better how, it's funny because I've taught this method so many times. It's so powerful as a way to give feedback. And But one of the things that I ask people is, can you tell me the the method that we just talked about? And so many people say, what was good, what was bad, and how am I going to change it, right? It's not bad, it's better, right? What can we do better? And and that's an observation. Bad is a judgment, right? Mm-hmm. So good, bad, judgment, and how, right? And the how is completely different if that's bad yeah. instead of better, is that using an optimistic lens, do you think? Like if someone were to say, well, that's just optimism. I don't think so no. because it's I, – I, I can tell you, you know, dealing with elite-level athletes, corporate executives, you know, yeah. elite uh, people in medical fields and so forth, I've delivered some pretty harsh feedback mm-hmm. like on the surface, but it's done in a way that it's for improvement and that they know it's done out of caring. Mm-hmm. And so – um, I don't think it's obs- – I think what happens is that, it, you know, the compliment sandwich, yeah. uh, sometimes called the shit sandwich. <laughs> Terrible. Right? I think it's a horrible <laughs> method because everybody knows. Right. All they're doing is waiting for the, exactly. the shit in the middle, right? Yeah. Um, but this one actually is you have to be objective. In fact, when we're teaching it, we're like, what objectively, what was good? Objectively, what could be better? Now let's put a plan together to make that better, and that's your how. Mm-hmm. Right. So it actually tries to remove judgment and impart objectivity in that whole process. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about it is the better is there. It doesn't help us. Well, let me say this differently. In the short run, Mm -hmm. we thrive. Most people thrive on negative feedback. That same negative feedback then starts to create a negative cycle and that creates burnout. Where I need the negativity to keep going? Well, so what happens is if you if you are only looking at the negative, yeah. which, by the way, we're taught to do. We're wired, for most, right? For. <laughs> right. So if you're only looking at the negative, what happens is you only start seeing the negative. There's a uh, saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Yeah. And so if, you're, if your design, uh, if you look at negative... It's not just about that negative. You're actually uh, training the brain, an area called the reticular activating system, specifically to look at negative. And you're right, we're wired that way because negative is danger. Right. Like one of the things that's it's fascinating to me, the brain is fascinating, by the way, to me. And one of the things about it is if I drive from work to home or vice versa, I'm actually predicting – Without me knowing it, I'm predicting the entire way what's happening. What's the traffic going to be like? What kind of cars am I going to see? What are What's going to happen and so forth? And if that happens, just like I predicted, I don't remember anything about it because I predicted it's true, I let it go. I predicted it's true, I let it go. But if one thing goes wrong, like, for example, traffic was slower, or there was an accident or somebody cut me off or those kinds of things – all of a sudden, my prediction was violated, mm-hmm. and now snaps I'm going to— right, s- Snaps me into the moment. There's a danger, opportunity. I remember it. Not only do I remember it, when I get home, I talk about it, right? All these different things because we're wired to see the negative mm-hmm. because of our ancient tools, our ancient genes, right? That's a survival mechanism. But we're not in that environment anymore. And so we need to rise above that— or else we're going to create chronic stress, we're going to create unhealthy attitudes, we're going to create negative relationships, 
with ourselves and with other people. And so, yeah, I mean, we're wired. So this good, better, how, the good part is becomes really important. And one of the things that's really interesting about it, when you ask people in the very beginning, especially high achievers, okay, tell me what was good about that presentation. No. No. Yeah. Well, I, I screwed this part up. I'm not asking Instantly. you that question. <laughs> what was good about it, right? Yeah. And it's hard for people because they're so used to looking at areas that need improvement. Yeah. Right. Well, then high achievers could that, that a lot a part of how they think is like it's fuel. It's like I have a, I made a mistake. The mistake needs to be corrected so I can get closer to my goal, so I can make progress, so I could do whatever. So I'm just thinking of a moment when I worked with a university sports team and I asked them the good, better, how, and instantly they're like, "Oh, this is what we could do. This is what we could do different." I made a mistake here. I'm like, "Yes, but what what did you do good?" Mm-hmm. Well, I could do this better. Da, da, da. I was like, we're not on better yet. Good. And it took like a minute and a half for him to finally like sit down and think through it. And then he listed one thing. And then that one thing turned into three things. Yeah. But it was so natural. Right. And so I had, we had to break that cycle, but it's, it's a, I think it's, they use it. And this is just me thinking about it. Like they, they use it as a form of either self-affirmation of like, I don't think I'm, where I need to be. Therefore, this information fits that model to get me to where I think I need to be, right? It's like a self-efficacy or self-esteem builder mm-hmm. in a way. But then when you say, don't think about it that way, then their attachment to it almost causes them to think maybe lower of themselves in a way. So how do you? How would you help someone navigate that? What would you pinpoint? Would you take them through this exact same process or would you say something different? I'll tell you the, the very first time <laughs> I remember using Good Better How is with a guy who was, you know, I work with uh, golf in yeah. particular. A um, bunch of different sports, but mostly golf. And this guy had just shot a uh, course record at the Collegiate Masters, which is a really big time uh, college golf tournament. And I said to him, man, that was a great round. Congratulations. He goes, did you see I missed a four-footer on 17? And I'm like, dude, <laughs> you just shot the course record. You're yeah. leading this tournament. And he says, yeah, but I would have shot a 63 if I made that putt. Right. So to your point, I said, tell me something that was good about the round. He goes, I just told you I missed a putt on 17. I go, tell me something that was good. And it took probably five or six minutes before he would say something good. And then he negated it. He would say, well, I hit 12 fairways, but I missed these fairways, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? But I, but I, and it was so hard for him to let go of the negative. Understanding that he was going to have an opportunity, right, to talk about things that could be better. And, And the better how, you know, we put together, right, because it's not just what could be better. How are you going to make it better becomes important, Mm -hmm. right? So saying I missed this putt, you know, I, I it, now all of a sudden he takes that and instead of I missed this putt, I missed this putt, I missed this putt. Guess what happens the next day when he has a four footer, right? He's been talking himself out of that four footer for 24 hours. But if he says, you know what I, uh, what I recognize is I actually lost focus for a minute. I started thinking about making a birdie instead of actually being in the moment with it. Okay, what are you going to do tomorrow? right? I'm going to make sure that I'm in the moment. That's a completely different situation. Mm -hmm. But again, most of us are taught to think about the, the negativity Mm -hmm. around that. Again, that's not a, that's not a being optimistic. That's being, you know, uh, objective in there and strategic with it. Mm -hmm. But it takes, it takes somebody trusting the process and, and in your case, you know, trusting you as Mm -hmm. well when you're talking to them about it and a little bit of success. Um, you know, we, we're we doing a workshop right now with, with some uh, surgical departments at the university, at the med school. And one of the, the feedback pieces that we get from them is, okay, we buy into this, but this other group won't. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Uh, and, and it's probably reasonable feedback because that's not the way either group was trained. And so it does take faith because it's a paradigm shift, Mm -hmm. right? You're so used to, especially again at high achievers, you're so used to hearing the negative. 
when you were talking, what occurred to me is that negative feedback that we're used to, that's like monster energy drink, right? It, it does yeah. get your energy up, but it's so bad for you, right? Especially in the long run. If mm -hmm. every time it's monster energy, monster energy, monster energy, it will get your, you know, get you up, but you're going to come crashing down. So what if you could have something that systematically mm -hmm. got you to that point on a consistent basis that turned out to be good for you? And right. that's what it is, right? right? Because the just, sorry, I don't want to go too, too no, far yeah, on this, ahead. but the other thing is it's not just about that moment. It's about the next time you're in that opportunity. And if all you're thinking about is the bad, your physiology changes. It's like you're, you're locking it into place. You're locking it into place. You're creating more arousal, more anxiety around it. And the likelihood of success decreases. Yeah. I think that's the key right there. And then the cycle continues. It loosens the, the grip of the finality of it. Right? It's like, I made that mistake. Snap of that moment in time. And that's all exists in my mind. And I have to work on correcting it, but you're still operating from the, the frame of you missed the putt. Mm -hmm. So I missed the putt is still the premise. Right. As opposed to I lost focus, which resulted in me missing the putt, which is something that I can control. Correct. As opposed to living in a, in a movie where I already know the ending. Yeah, that's yeah. it's exactly right. I mean, there's so much to that as mm -hmm. well. I mean, it sounds simple on the surface, but there's so much to that. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, ultimately the things that we talk about may sound like they're attitude things or whatever, but at some point they're affecting the physiology, the, the uh, peripheral physiology, the neural physiology. They're affecting these things because that's dictating your next behavior. Because mm -hmm. it's a predict, our brains are predictive. Right. Right. We, we do typically what we've done. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to anticipate that this is going to happen again. Therefore, I'm going to prepare my neurobiology, my ph physiology, my thought process so that when I in insert that enter that arena, like I already have preconceived notions of what's going to happen. So right. it's how do I prepare myself to enter the moment with being the most prepared and the most flexible? Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yeah. And and this Good Better How Method does that. Yeah. There there are nuances mm -hmm. to it. You know, you, you, you have to learn it from people who know how to do it. You have to uh, practice it. You have to look at the nuances to it. It sounds really simple on the surface, which is one of the great things about it. Mm -hmm. There's a deep, deep understanding of the science around it as well that that dictates those nuances. But the essence of it is exactly what you say. It's not only helps us in the moment mm -hmm. to put perspective around what happened and put a plan together for what we're going to do next time. It also helps us in the next moment because we walk in with a plan and confidence and we're not afraid. This is the big thing. If in that putt example, I'm afraid for the next seven, the next four foot putt. Right. Right. Because if I miss it, then it affirms that I'm not who I think I am. Right. Right. But then that's about you. That's ego, right? <laughs> I mean, it just, it's the circle that keeps spinning. Right. right. And so if I walk in instead with, oh, okay, I understand how to, how to deal with this situation now. It's completely different. Yeah. Right. And so, and then you track that out over weeks and months and years. And, and then to your other point, you start thinking about how you talk to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a game changer. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking about professional athletes that have had meteoric rise and success. And then you see a lot of their personal life kind of fall apart. And mm -hmm. then that interferes a lot with their professional side. And then their whole world kind of implodes. I'm not saying that that one putt is a result of all that chaos, but it's a contributing factor, right? Yeah. So, Would you, you know, say? yeah, it's interesting. W one of the, f the, the very first, w regardless, the very first formula I talk to the golfers about mm -hmm. is we call it the performance formula. Ability minus interference equals performance. And so if you could go out and shoot a 65, but you shoot a 75, part of that 10 stroke difference is because you had interference. You were thinking about um, the, the, the score. You were thinking about the next hole. You were thinking about your opponent. You were thinking something was going on. 
And it's not just thinking about it because that thinking about it manifests itself in your physiology. Mm -hmm. For golfers, it's grip pressure, yeah. right? That changes a lot. Their breathing changes a lot. But it's the same with people who are going to uh, do a presentation in the corporate world. Leaders that you're talking about, it's the same thing, right? They're not in the right physiological uh, situation mm -hmm. to be able to create their best work. And so... You know, th this becomes one of these things that if you, it, and, and just to follow this out, so the, this person could shoot a 65, they shot a 75. And so what they do is they go and work on their, their skill, mm -hmm. right? Their ability. Well, their ability isn't the reason they shot a 65 because the day, or 75, the day before when they were practicing, they shot a 65. Right. So it's not that skill or ability changes, it's that interference changes. And the greatest example of this in in anywhere I've seen happens to be in golf, and it's Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. Tiger Woods was the greatest golfer maybe ever, one day. And then he had a seven iron through the back window of his car. Mm -hmm. And and yes, he got in an accident, but that's not the reason he dropped so far, right? He had won, a, I think it was a U.S. Open maybe, with a broken leg at one point. So a seven iron and a little scratch is not going to, to mm -hmm. drop him that far. It wasn't that his ability changed, is the interference changed. Yeah. And so often we work on just ability and we never work on interference, you know, decreasing interference. Yeah. And again, this isn't just sports. This is in every Everything. aspect that we have. And so, so the challenge point, one of the things about the challenge point framework is it actually teaches you how to work on ability and interference at the same time. And so you, you're, de you're increasing ability, you're decreasing interference, and the net result is much better performance. Right. But yeah, m most people don't think about that simple equation, but it's so, so important in dictating your actual outcome. Do you have like a, a quick example of like what an exercise would be to help someone decrease interference? Well, I'll tell you one of the the really good things is uh, controlling your breathing. You know, yeah. control your breathing, control your breath, control your life. You hear this in uh, yoga all the time.